Welcome to Masterclass. I'm Pamela Jacarino, Editor-in-Chief of Lux Interiors and Design. Today, I'm thrilled to have A-list designer extraordinaire and the ultimate million-dollar decorator, Martin Lawrence Ballard. Martin, hi, how are you? Hello, Pam. How lovely to be here. How exciting to be doing a Masterclass with you. I know, and I see you're in your fabulous home in Los Angeles with that amazing ceiling. Is that hand-painted? It is. Um, a guy called Brad Southwick literally camped out here for three weeks on his back painting that. It was sort of, it was sort of my own ode to the Sistine Chapel. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes. I mean, the fifth wall is very important. We know that. And yours is, of course, fantastic. I love it. And I've been in your home and it is just incredible. I want to take it back to the early days. You came to LA via London to be an actor. That's and right. uh, you were in a film and the producer of that film came to your home. He admired your place and he asked you to design his office. And that job led to another job, led to another job. And here we are today. You've got a thriving design business. But I'm curious, what did your rental look like back in the day? And what made him, you know, <laughs> what was he attracted to? You know, I, I really started my career without knowing it. Um, at the age of 12, um, I sort of had convinced my dad on a Saturday morning to let me go to the local flea market, which was in a place called Greenwich, which is sort of South London. And I'd used my little bit of allowance, you know, whatever it was, five or 10 pounds or whatever it was back then. And I'd run around really early in the morning and buy things that I thought were pretty off of other people's stalls. You know, bits of little cups and saucers, lace tablecloths, maybe the odd silver spoon, stuff that I could afford that I thought was cool. And I would bring it all back to my stand and set it all up and make it look pretty and sell it to unsuspecting American tourists a few hours later. So you <laughs> were a, a profit, merchant. You were a merchant. <laughs> <laughs> and so that was really, I was doing that because it was my hobby and it was what I loved, but really and truly, it was my learning path. It was actually the thing that, that taught me period, style, um, how to put things together. And I did that until I was uh, almost 17. And actually I made enough money to put myself through drama school. And then as you said, I came to the States, I flailed around a little bit, I ended up um, getting a movie. And so the little house that, that, that Victor Ginsburg was the producer's name, that came to visit um, that I had. It was, it was tucked in the middle of West Hollywood. Funky little place. It used to be uh, star dressing rooms for Charlie Chaplin. And so because it was dressing rooms, it was very sort of, sort of small and narrow, but really high ceilings. And I literally used my, my ill-gotten talent from the flea markets to run around all the new places I found here, like the Rose Bowl and the Santa Monica Airport flea market. And I bought old ceiling fans and sort of beaten up leather club chairs. And I created this kind of, you know, almost colonial experience in there. Big palm trees. I mean, I really had no money. So it was all about sort of putting together a look, kind of a film set, I guess. And um, he loved that kind of out of Africa moment. And that's really what he asked me to do in his office. So it was kind of amazing that, that he loved this, this, eclectic flea market finds situation and wanted to translate it into, at the time, one of the major production offices in LA. That's fantastic. And I love, I love that, you know, sometimes I think that those, that's the best training, right, for designers just to get on with it and to do it and to, you know, discover what turns you on and how you put things together. 
Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, you know, I've had no formal training, nothing whatsoever in the design field. Um, like I said, my training was really hands on. It was buying something for for two dollars and selling it for four because you put it together with something else and it looked pretty. And that really is actually the main trick to interior design. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And, you know, it's so interesting because there I know a lot of actors who have then become designers. So I don't know. Like, how do you, do you, do you see your, you know, when you're approaching your design, do you imagine it as you're creating an environment and a set? Talk a little bit about those similarities for you. Yeah, I mean, you know, obviously actors are creative beings as well, of course, and you're creating a character, you're, you're setting a scene. And an interior is really a scene. It's hopefully a scene that reveals the personality of you or your client. Um, but it is, it, it's a scene, it's a stage set. It, 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 it's a space that is your pronunciation to the world of, hey, this is my taste. You do see actually, it's interesting, there are a lot of actors, a lot of theater actors actually that turn to become interior designers because I think they get to understand on the stage how space works, you know, how much room you need to move around things, how lighting creates drama, how, how the placement of things, you know, one of the things that I love that they say in the movies is, light to the money shot which means you can have a set full of a bunch of old crap really and then you've got one amazing armoire or one expensive chair or something and you'll see that's the piece that they kind of keep the camera on most of the time and, and it's also a trick that you can do in your interiors you know you can you can fill your your room with you know things from crate and barrel for instance and then you've got one or two vintage items that are in the prize spot and suddenly you've created this extraordinary look where it all looks like it's sort of eclectic and amazing. So and elevated, yeah. And I, yeah, I, I, exactly. and I love that high-low mix too. I mean, that's, you know, those are the best interiors that are just all about this in interesting mix that's a bit unexpected. Um, you have said that you're, you, you, and, and, and for any designer, but you know, your taste and, and is, is always evolving. And, you know, Martin, you are exposed to just the finest and most glamorous in design through where you travel and your persona and who you're exposed to. I'm curious what you've personally been into lately, especially since like you've been at home. I guess you've got, you've got your home in LA and in Palm Springs. Yeah. But how have you been uh, turned on to things during the pandemic? And what have you turned on by? Wow. <clears throat> it has, it's been so interesting being at home for, for, well, for a year, basically. And so the thing, that, the thing that has struck the chord with me the most is, you know, forget trends, forget fashion, forget what people are putting in catalogs telling you should buy. As always you know, the ultimate trend, the ultimate luxury at home is comfort. So for me, it's about understanding that comfort is king, that every room in your home, you should be able to lounge in, lie in, read in, you know, do whatever the hell you want to in it, because we should be using all of our spaces and enjoying all of our spaces. The, you know, the old adage of saving, you know, best for high days and holidays, no use everything today, enjoy everything today, set a table with grandma's china, you know, put the chandelier on when you're having breakfast. I mean, we have to live our lives. You know, as Auntie Mame said, it, you know, life is a banquet and some poor suckers are starving to death. Live, <laughs> live, live. And so for me, that's, that's what I've got out of, uh, out of um, by the way, I did watch Auntie Mame twice during, uh, during the pandemic. <laughs> And you can do it. I mean, the thing that's so great about that philosophy too, and which I love is like, you could do it on a grand scale and you could do it on a simple scale. You know, you can, you can just, you know, go into your garden, cut the flowers and, and put them in a vase. And it brings just a special moment. Um, and, I, and I think that as we're all in our homes, this has been a lesson, right? We're, we're not traveling. So it's like, how do we create experience and things that make us feel good while we're, while we're in our home? Yeah, and, it, and it's, you know, it, for me, you know, I, my home's always full of books. I love books, you know, they're, they're great for inspiration. And of course, they're wonderful props for decorating with. But one of the things that I've done is I've actually sat and read my books, which has been amazing. You know, and I got super inspired by, by, by going through all of my books and things. Some that I bought five years ago and never even opened. So that was kind of a wonderful thing. And of course, 
books really are such an inspiration for us. I mean, I usually gather my inspo from travel. You know, when, when young designers or aspiring designers come to me and they say, oh, what, what college should I go to? What school should I go to? What course should I take? I say, take the course of the world. Get a, get a ticket and go travel. Now, whether that means you get on a bus and go two towns over, or you get on a plane and fly to Rome, travel gives you everything. It's the people, the places, the smells, all of those things that just soak into us and kind of, they are there forever that we can draw on. And that is, that. if you can't travel, then get a bunch of great books because <laughs> that also feeds your soul. Absolutely. Um, Martin, you have done homes for extraordinary people and A-list celebrities. I will name a few because the list is so long. Kylie Jenner, Courtney and Khloe Kardashian, Tommy Hilfiger, Cher, Ellen Pompeo, on and on and on. And you know, you, you've just done some magnificent uh, you know, interiors and work. Tell us what's like the most daring and exciting request that you've had from a client that you were just very excited to tackle. You know, I, I think when people ask me this, I've been so lucky because I've had so many extraordinary clients. And when you're working with, with those kind of like major entertainers where they've lived their life, you know, under a camera, oftentimes they're not scared of being adventurous at home. You know, they, they, they want to go for it. And so I've gotten to do some amazing interiors. I have to say that Cher was always extraordinary, you know, because... She, on my, I've done several jobs for her, but, but my first one, um, when I first wet, met her, she told me that she um, wanted to live like the first wife of a Maharaja. As one does. So As do one I. does. <laughs> As big, big, big diamonds and sapphires everywhere. <laughs> there, was, there was lots of that going on, by the way. But so, so, you know, so when somebody gives you that as their, as their design, ethos you know you've got a lot to play with I mean and so we did I did amazing things with her you know I bought um I bought oh my god facades of palaces in India I bought uh old ceiling panels from from a colonial villa in Pakistan I bought uh unbelievable uh, ancient Buddhas from China uh, amazing Kuan Yin's I mean, I got to buy all of these extraordinary things and recreate them in her, in her then penthouse. Um, and so that is a journey of, of extraordinary uh, passion, you know, on, on both of our sides. Um, and it led to these magical interiors. Um, funny enough, I just saw there's an article out on them in People magazine today, which, which out of the blue, um, but it brought back such extraordinary memories. And everything there, you know, she said to me, you know, and I also want to want to be a Buddhist, but behaving badly. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I had all these amazing kind of back, uh, back painted glass, Vergli Mise uh, panels done with sort of with sort of mild scenes from the Kama Sutra that, that yeah. lit a hallway to the bedroom. You know, so we kind of jazzed it up a little bit, but I it was that's really such fun. an incredible design brief to have. And, and, you know, again, this sense of adventure that you get to take, that's just so exciting, you know, cultures and traveling and, and putting it all together. And you, as you said, like in this interior environment has, has got to be um, fantastic. Um, I also want to talk to you about color because you love sort of a gutsy use of, of color. I think in your design work, there is what I would call a fabulosity to everything that you do. Um, how, you know, for people that are watching, you know, how do you like to approach color? And then, you know, how do, how do people strike that right balance, Martin, between like, you know, what's bold yet livable? Color is such an important thing. To me, color is the essence of life. You know, I, I am not a, a beige person. I need color, I feed from color, I love it. Um, you know, to me, it's as important as sunlight in a room to give you energy. But people are scared of color. You know, they really are. They're scared of color because they've been taught that, that you know, real estate brokers say, oh, don't paint your house pink because people only wanna see it in white or cream because then they can understand it. It's nonsense. 
if you love pink, I assure you somebody else does too. And that person's the one that's going to end up buying your house. You know, so there's something for everyone in the world. Um, color though, one of, the, one of the first ways to ease somebody into color is to start off doing it in the smallest room in the house, which usually is the powder room. You know, and there you can be adventurous. You can add color in. It's a tiny space. Powder rooms can always be fantasy like and it introduces somebody to the use of having color saturation around them, um, which I think is, is a really fun way to do it. But one of the things that I say to people about color is, you know, what's your favorite color to wear? <laughs> of course, they usually say black. And then once we've got past that, it's like, you know, it's blue or it's green or it's yellow. So if somebody feels good, if they feel sexy in a, in a blue dress, then, they're gonna feel pretty good in a blue room, surrounded by that tone that makes their eyes pop or makes their skin look beautiful. And so that's a really great way to ease people into color, is to say, what is your favorite color? Think about how that makes you feel when you wear it. And then let's try it in your room or on your sofa or on lampshades, you know? Right. And it's, it, it's a great way to ease them in. And believe me, once you're into color, there is no turning back. Because <laughs> it's, it's such a fun form of exercise. I, you can see from my background, I love color. It's hard for me to be in a neutral, in a neutral space at all. So Martin, what's your number one piece of advice for design clients or anyone who's sort of looking to add magic and mystery into their home? Like what's something that they can, I don't know, maybe tackle that's, I don't want to use the word easy because easy doesn't sound like fun, but something relatively I don't even want to say the word simple. Take it away, well, Martin. <laughs> well, you know that you know the simplest trick that is probably one of the most important is a dimmer switch. You know, lighting is everything in life. If you could be in the most beautiful room and if it's overlit, you're going to feel uncomfortable. You know, lighting allows us to change ambiance, to change the mood, but it also allows a room to go from blah to fabulous. Dimmer lights, lights and candles, hey presto. And that was about 20 bucks. We did put dimmer switches in every single room because at this point in my life, it is a little scary for me to be in bold, <laughs> harsh light. So dimmer you know, you know, candles it is, darling. Yeah, you know, living in Hollywood, it's one of the things that we learn first is, is, is about lighting because certainly when, you're, when you work with actors and actresses, they never want to be lit from above. They want to be lit from the front. You know, even when I worked with the Kardashians, we had to find ways to add like little light strips into the ceiling that when they were on, they kind of blew you out and made you look amazing. So uh, lighting is so important on every level. It makes you feel good. And if you feel good, you're going to feel good in your room. And if your room feels good, it's going to be inviting to everybody else around you. It's all about lighting and that touch up my appearance on my Zoom, um, <laughs> my Zoom application. <laughs> <laughs> That's the secret for me during this pandemic. <laughs> Martin, you have designed so much incredible product over your um, career. Everything from lighting, tile, fabrics, wallpaper, porcelain, jewelry. You've got many, many, many fabulous collections. I am so curious what your dream product is to design. And I also, I will let you answer and then I'm going to come back with my thoughts on what I would like to see you design, but you go ahead first and tell me what's on your wish list. Well, you know, I've, I've always loved jewelry. And so I was really excited to do a little jewelry collection. And to be honest, I'd love to really expand that. I mean, it's, it's sort of a very odd, you know, offshoot from my interiors, but I do love it. I think it's super exciting. But you know, one of the most interesting things is that I have all those licenses from fabric and, and, and wallpapers and tiles, and as you said, porcelain. Um, I don't really have a furniture line. Oh. Yeah, I mean, when I, was, when I was creative director at, at Frontgate for, for the last three years, we did furniture, but it was done in a whole lifestyle experience, and a lot of it was outdoors, sort of indoor-outdoor experience. So I've never actually done a real solid furniture line, which is extraordinary, really, when you think about the 16 licenses that I have. So... Uh, at some point, is I'm there any breaking break. news that we want to share here on Design TV, or what? <laughs> well, you know, you know, you know, I have a, I have, coming out this year. I have a great new collection with the Shade Store, by the way. Oh, fabulous! Which has been really fun because 
you know, it's totally to the public. So unlike so many of my collections have been either really high end, like the Haviland or the Dome and the Christophe have been very high end products. But, you know, this is really, obviously designers use the shade still too, but this is also to the public. So it's Absolutely. so nice to be able to have product that is direct to consumer. And I'm excited to see what people do with these fun fabrics and things that I've created for shades and, and, and drapery. Well, I'm looking but, forward but, but, to it. But no, uh, no, still no furniture line yet. I've, listen, I've turned about six different people down because I want the right partner to do it with. Absolutely. Well, I, I think that will be incredible. And I am also just going to say, just putting it out into the universe, because I, for one, would love to see this. Um, I feel like you need to, or he should call you, um, Elon Musk. I feel like you should design the first Starship rocket that they put out to Mars when people, when like the public, because that would be amazing for it to go into a rocket ship designed by Martin Lawrence Ballard to Mars. I'm just yeah, putting the, it out there. By the that way, would be I am, fabulous. I'm dumping that furniture line and definitely taking your idea. <laughs> I feel like you could, I know you, so I feel like you could do the furniture probably like, you know, a year or two, because the rocket really, honestly, for, for, for high rollers that want to go to Mars, that's a couple of years off. So I'm going to say, I'm going to put in for you to do both. No pressure. I think, I think that would be amazing. I mean, it would be so exciting to do something like that, right? Because it is literally out of this world. Yes. Yeah. So I have one more class question, and then we're going to do our fun rapid fire. Um... You know, your your work and you as a person, your whole aura exemplifies a beautiful, glamorous um, life. What are your what are your tips um, for for our audience to sort of, you know, to live a good life? And, and, and you know, what what is your philosophy that you can share, Martin? Well, I think, you know, I said it earlier that the modern luxury is comfort, you know, don't have anything around you in your home, wherever you are, that you don't feel like is comfortable, that you want to lounge on and make love on and touch. You know what I mean? Life is for living. It's so important. And as the great Oscar Wilde said, remember, all beautiful things belong to the same age. So don't ever be stuck in thinking, just because you've got a modern sofa, you've got to have a modern armchair, you can mix it up with a bit of vintage. You know, if a if a if a if a bowl from CB2 sits next to a Picasso painting and they're both beautiful, they're going to be more beautiful together. So never be afraid, never follow fashion, follow your heart, and that will always lead to beauty. Oh, I love that. Okay, and we're going to wrap this up with my inside the designer's studio rapid fire questions. Martin Lawrence Ballard, what is your favorite word? Delicious. What is your least favorite word? No. What turns you on creatively, spiritually, or emotionally? Travel. What turns you off? Not traveling. <laughs> <laughs> what is your favorite curse word? Oh, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> What sound or noise do you love, Martin? I love the sound of laughter. What sound or noise do you dislike? Crying. What profession other than your own would you like to attempt? I'd really like to be a pop star. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You would be fabulous as a pop star. Oh my God, I could just... The wardrobe would be fantastic. It's all about the wardrobe. It's all about the wardrobe. Oh my God, that, yeah, that would be, oh, that would be so fun. Someone should just storyboard that out. I'm just saying, that's another thing I'm putting out into the universe. Um, <laughs> Martin, my final question is this. If heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say when you arrive at the pearly gates? You lived, you loved, and you decorated. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Martin. It is such a treat to be with you and to speak with you. Um, I love your insight and everything that you have to say. And thanks for being part of Design TV today. Always such a pleasure to see you. Thank you so much.
how can we create opportunities for other people that maybe don't have opportunities or know how to find opportunities? Um, and then how do we have a great impact for the, for the end user? If you see someone who looks like you doing something, you're like, oh, well, maybe I can do that too. For us, design um, really is a holistic um, approach to life problems. Hi everyone, it's Lisa Bingham Dewart and I am Lux's Southern California, LA and Pacific Northwest Homes Editor. Today it is my great pleasure to welcome Dana Batista of Charlotte Barnes Interior Design um, out in Connecticut, who is here to talk about a wonderful project in Beverly Hills that we had the, the great pleasure of running um, in our January, February 2021 um, LA edition. So welcome, welcome Dana. I'm so happy you're here. Um, and I am so excited to talk about this house because there are so many, it ha it's just one of those great houses with so much story and background and richness. And um, I think we could probably talk about it for, for several hours, but we're going to limit, limit ourselves in the interests of, of everyone's time. But can you talk to me a little a bit about um, the clients and how you connected with them and what they wanted and what they were looking for in a house. So I connected with the clients. Um, I'm very close to the clients. Um, it's my sister and brother-in-law. And they have a great history of togetherness, not togetherness. They um, had a bi-coastal uh, life for a long time. And um, they were in London. It was the first time that they had lived together in London. And they thought that they were going to be there for about five years. And I initially went to London to help them sort of merge her sensibility and his sensibility. So it was good for both of them. And it turned out that the um, stint in London was short-lived. And so then they were finally going to move, be under one roof in Los Angeles. And so that's how it started. And that's how I know the clients. <laughs> and, um, and from there, it was just, you know, two years of fun. And, and creative juices and ideas. And it was, it was a great project to work on. So, so they, they, they come to Los Angeles and how did they, did they find the house? Did they have some specific parameters? Did they have a house in mind? Did they have a neighborhood in mind? How are they, what, what was sort of their vision for the house? So they definitely had a neighborhood in mind. They almost didn't go for this house because um, it doesn't have a real great driveway. So it's a corner lot and, um, and it's a small house, which is the beauty of it. It's just the two of them. Um, so they looked at a lot of houses and everything that they saw a lot of um, houses had been redone. And so it just, you know, it wasn't their sensibility. So they really found this, you know, diamond in the rough kind of house to make it whatever they wanted it to be, to create, you know, this gem that it is. Now, remind me, it's, it's a house from the 20s or the 30s, was it? Uh... The 30s. Okay, 30s. 30s Mediterranean. Right. So kind of one of those classic, almost old Hollywood kind of feeling houses. Um, and you mentioned it was a di diamond in the rough. So what was kind of the, the state that you found it in? Was it fairly well preserved or? Well, I think it, it was. It was definitely cared for. So it wasn't dilapidated or, you know, um, it was nice. Um, and but the first, the first goal was to really bring it to life. 
And that first step was changing out the wood French doors and window frames to the steel powder coated windows and doors, which is a game changer. Um, so that was the best part of it. Um, there were certain, air, like it, it didn't require a lot of construction, um, but it was just sort of like rethinking how to use the space inside. And one of the things, if you look at the pictures of the living room and there is a you know, wide open archway in the living room that goes to the back, you know, to the hall, to the master bedroom, that was a teeny tiny door. And so, so this wonderful living room just like funneled back to the back of the house. And so we just really opened it up, um, which, which was fun to do. Um, so, so I, one of the things that you had mentioned in, in your interview for the feature was that you described the house as a Fabergé egg. Um, and I think it's, it's a really perfect description of it because I think one of the great things about this house is it seems like almost every single piece in the house tells some sort of story or has some sort of resonance. I mean, everything there just even, you know, the existing pieces, the new pieces, there's just there's such a richness and a depth to, to every, every decision you made. So um, I wanted to jump back to something that you had said at the beginning, which was that you were helping kind of merge their styles. So what were their sort of disparate uh, styles that they were operating with? Um, well, uh, my brother-in-law is very um, sleek. So he likes a lot of Art Deco pieces and things that are probably more masculine. And my sister, I wouldn't say shabby chic, but she appreciates, you know, old fashioned things and things that are a little more um, natural. So it was, kind of combining those sensibilities where you have something that's really super stylish, but it's not something that, you know, you can stamp a date on it and say, oh, that was the look of 2017 or whatever it was. So it is combining both of their sensibilities where they're both happy. So we we talked a little bit about how you had done some updating on the on the house, and I know that you updated kind of all the sort of behind the scenes systems and things. Mm -hmm. um, but you also did some, and you mentioned you did the work on the the door in the living room. But you also updated that foyer area as well, correct? Mm -hmm. um, when you first enter the house, what were, what was sort of the goal right there? So, what I will say about the house and and. I, I sort of wish that um, some of the bathrooms got in. What is so fabulous about the house is the tile and the marble that we chose. And um, the floor tile in the entry um, is this iridescent, um, like it looks a little purple, it looks a little blue, it looks a little green. So it's an iridescent tile and it's just magnificent. Um, so the previous entry just had a solid wood door and it was, I think it was um, like painted black um, octagon terracotta tiles. So it was really, really flat, kind of dense. And with the, you know, all glass, you know, the, the paned front door, and then the, the luster of the tile, it just like twinkles. It just sort of like, you know, is alive. Um, and also in the front entrance are, um, there's a door to a powder room and there's the door to the closet. And then we used a fine paints of Europe, Holland lac for those doors. So the whole entry is just this sort of glowing, beautiful, entry. 
It really, it really is. And then I think another spot that I feel like has that sort of glow to it is, is the library, which um, has a lot of, uh, I, I feel like it's one of those spaces that almost encapsulates a lot of what you were doing in the house. Um, so, you know, one of the most notable things I think is that eggplant color on the cabinet. So can you talk a little bit about um, how you came how you came to to decide on the the eggplant uh, hue and and um, what that what that meant for that room. So, um, in that room, there are a lot of George Smith pieces that were from the London house, and so you know, of course, we're not going to reupholster or throw away George Smith furniture. So we were able to fit it into the room beautifully, along with the carpet. And um, the, the sofa is a beautiful gray mohair and the, um, the, the club chairs are this fabulous um, Paul Smith stripe. Now, my immediate thought was that it would be beautiful in that eggplant color. And it is almost a neutral actually. And it's sort of, if we had gone with, um, my brother-in-law was like, nah, I don't know, I don't know. And I'm like, trust me, it's beautiful. And, um, you know, it's, it's, you're not gonna see it coming and going everywhere. Um, and if we had done like a gray lacquer or something like that, it would have been sort of of that feeling that is stamped, you know, 2017 or 20, whatever. So I think, all of the color is very harmonious with each other. And again, it is, it just glows. And, and the sunset in that room is magnificent. Um, the, the views from the house are great. So it just, you know, everything just sort of like twinkles and glows, but it's, it's a great color. Um, and you, you had mentioned that you had reused the George Smith pieces. Had you, had, had those been pieces that then you'd helped or find, helped them find when they were living in London um, previously? They had already, they had already purchased those. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the good thing about my sister and brother-in-law is that they enjoy collecting. They're both very, uh, they both have a very good eye. Um, and so that's fun too, that they're, you know, they're invested as well. So it's not just um, a house full of objects for no purpose. Right, 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 right. Um, and then, and there's some, there's some antique, the, the piano in the living room, that's a family antique, isn't it? Yes, so um, we grew up in Connecticut and that was, that, piano was in our house growing up my entire life. So um, when my parents sold the house, I guess it was like going on 20 years ago, um, my sister had the piano and she just sort of traveled around with it. <laughs> it's not one of the more portable items. Oh, right, exactly, exactly. <laughs> it's not like, oh, these are my favorite plates. You know, it's like committed to a piano. Right, right, right. You have to, that's, that's some like pre-planning that has to go into schlepping that thing everywhere. Yeah. Um, so, so getting back to the, to the living room, you had mentioned the sort of combination of their, their aesthetics with the, the sleeker and the, the more kind of, I don't know, bohemian or shabby chic. And I feel like the living room is actually a spot where that, that sort of tension and duality kind of plays out, but in just this really, fun and harmonious way. You're not like, what, what? Obviously two people with two very different aesthetics live here. So um, I, I, I'm just curious in terms of how, how you sort of put those pieces together um, to, in, in that space, for example, to, to sort of satisfy both those, those sort of divergent ideas. Well, it was, um... I think what came first was, believe it or not, the chandelier, um, which I found on first dibs. And it's massive and it's perfect for the house. So, you know, that was the first thing and we sort of went from there. They had chairs that were from London that 
eventually found um, spots elsewhere in the house. They had a coffee table that was okay. And, um, and then they, is it the, the, the sofa, the sofa I also found on first dibs, which is very, very stylish, very, you know, very chic. And then the little chairs in the pink velvet, I was at the Rose Bowl with my younger sister. And I was like, oh my God. And they were covered <laughs> in muslin. I'm like, oh my God, those chairs are beautiful. And I think they were $300 a pair. And then we had them recovered in this like yummy uh, Claremont cotton velvet. And, it, you know, you would never know. So that's the combination. It's like your very high end stylish um, sofa and then the chairs from the Rose Bowl and the little um, telephone table that again, my sister had. And if you saw it before, you'd be like, that should be on the corner for, you know, pickup. <laughs> but um, it's done in a fabulous Dadar fabric and it just, it's great. It's great. Well, I mean, it's, a, it's, a, you know, it's testament to what a little um, thought and some good fabric will do to kind of transform <laughs> pretty exactly. much anything into something that's really worth keeping, keeping around. Um, so uh, there, there are in the house, there are so many wonderful details. Um, just like it's eye candy. It's, 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 there's just something that will catch your eye and, and be exciting. Um, I love the kitchen. I think the kitchen is so fun. It's, there's, there's a lot of, a lot of stories in there. Um, as I understand it, they're, they're big, big cooks, correct? And my sister is, my sister is like, she just sent a picture the other day of, you know, her focaccia that she made. So every night she's cooking something and she's a fabulous cook. So, so in the kitchen, there's some, some fun, some fun details that the tiles, I believe were, were something that you guys spent a lot of time kind of workshopping and thinking about. So can you talk to us a little bit about those, those, those pieces? Yes. So uh, the, for the floor tile, um, there's a lot of green in the house, not, um, uh, green like the color green, not <laughs> renewable green. Mm -hmm. But um, there's a lot of green in the house because my sister loves the color green. So I went to um, Solar Antique Tiles and I saw this unbelievable, it was I think 18th century Italian tile. And I just knew the, I, I knew that was the floor 100%. And um, it was really expensive, <laughs> really expensive. So we tried to go a, you know, a less expensive route um, and we did a bunch of different trials. And then Pedro at Solar Antiques came up with an unbelievable idea, which was to take um, old tiles and glaze them new. So it wasn't the original glazed tile, which I guess made it so expensive, but we had like the body of old tiles. So they're perfectly imperfect waves and everything um, and glaze them new. And part of it is the size because I, I can't remember the, the size of the square, but everything that we looked at that was new was either much larger or much smaller. And there's something about that size which feels very old and you know European and and so it, it worked out great and then as we were you know so so the jewel of the crown is the O'Keefe and Merritt stove yes. and um and then it's like okay what are the what's the wall tiles again we didn't want a white kitchen um and then we saw you know we were looking and solar antique tiles came through again for us. So that's, that's the kitchen. Um, and I wanted to go back and talk a little bit about that O'Keefe and Merritt range, because that is, that, that's, that is really something. Was that, um, had they wanted a vintage stove like that, or was that? 
Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's, and that's the part of my um, sister's sensibility, you know, like that old California sort of like Chateau Marmont, you know, it's just like old California. And I think that that's what the biggest, you know, draw was for her. Um, and in fact, my mom, my mom has, I, I don't think it's a Kiva Merit, but also has her stove like that in um, San Diego. So we're big fans, <laughs> you know, it's like, oh, Wolf, no, you know, anyway, it was, it was that. Um, and, and, and you, did you have to do a lot of, were you able to just find one that had been completely restored or did you have to find one and then restore it yourself? Sorry. It had to be restored. There's a great place in Burbank who does, um, like they know everything, like what are the good years, what are the bad years for those type of um, stoves um, and ovens. And so they had it fully restored. Awesome, awesome. Mm -hmm. That's so cool. Um, and then, uh, so uh, one of the other things that I, I love is, is some of the other things that you've incorporated into the house were things that they really loved. For example, um, they really are, are have a, uh, a passion for Fornicetti. So um, can you talk a little bit about, about how you were able to weave some of that into, into the house? Well, I will say that they both love Italy. So there's, you know, on all their trips, they collect a little Fornicetti here and there. And um, it's, I, my sisters loved it forever. And um, I think it was, God, 20 something years ago, I used to be in the fashion industry and I would go to Italy for work and I would brought my sister back a couple of things, you know, a couple of Fornicetti things. So she's been collecting it for a lot of years. And, um, and one of the things that is absolutely incredible, and I give great credit to um, the, the people who did the mosaic, is the kitchen barbecue is based on the Fornicetti wallpaper. So, you know, if you, if, I, I think it's, oh, I can't speak Italian, but it's <laughs> Opicelli, I think it is but the birds. So, so the Fornicetti throughout the house, the lamps, um, the, uh, the, the bottom of the pool, the barbecue outside the kitchen, it's all sort of like touched and incorporated throughout the house. Um, it's yeah, that uh, some of the mosaic work is, is just such a such a such a moment there and did did you do as i recall there was a lot of 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 uh stone shopping to get those um birds just right is that is that yes. correct <laughs> so we had we worked with two great um resources um one is uh mission tile west in pasadena Shout out to Tisa. And, um, and then the other is, I think it's American, um, American Marble and Onyx. And so it, it was a lot of looking at slabs and looking at stones. So it was, Jason really did most of the work on the mosaics, but the other um, stone surfaces in the house, um, you know, for the, for the vanities and all of that, you, I was able to source for them and the bathrooms as well. That's, that's awesome. And just out of curiosity, were you shopping with, um, with them much, your, your sister and brother-in-law, or were you, did they kind of turn you loose? They turned me loose. <laughs> they turned me loose and they turned me loose. And that's what was really fun. Actually, I, I don't think there's a picture of it in the, um, in the library, there is in the in the bookshelves. There's a recessed part where there's marble on the bottom of the shelf, and it's this like very like full of color movement Brescia. And I showed it to my brother-in-law. He's like, nah, I don't know. That's really wild. You know, that's like a little wild. That's a little, but it's beautiful and it feels very. Um, again, sort of European, which is, which is really nice. And, and it just is colorful. 
it's not sterile, it's who they are. And, you know, I know them both well enough that, you know, nothing's going to veer too much to him and nothing's going to veer too much to her, but it just came together beautifully. Is it different designing for family versus designing for, for a client? Did you feel like you had more leeway, less leeway? What was, what was sort of your, um, it, I think, I think that I had, you know, with, with a client, um, that I don't know very well, you learn their sensibility and you work toward that. Um, and, and some people aren't willing to take a lot of risk. And I think that my sister and brother-in-law were definitely willing to take risk and they were like, yeah, let's go for it. Yeah. You know, it, there were very few, like none, no way, no way. So it was, it like, we sort of all jumped in together and, um, like towards the end of the project, it was like, okay things that were sort of lagging, it's like, okay, if two out of the three say yes, then it's a go. <laughs> so, but, but even that, there were no, there, there were, it didn't feel like, oh, we compromised. So it, it, it was, um, I had full leeway. And, and, and sometimes, you know, with clients that I don't know well, because I work with Charlotte Barnes, you know, we can, throw things out there. And if they're willing to take the risk, then it's, you know, it's a, it's a good, you know, it's successful. So mm -hmm. it, it makes everybody happy. Um, yeah, that's, 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 that's good. Um, and so last, last question, um, sort of jumping on the, the train of travel, um, was some of the, some of the architectural detailing that you did. Um, and for example, that ceiling and the primary bedroom, I think is, is, is a really great example of just elevating spaces and taking their interests. And, and so can you talk a little bit, um, about, about that ceiling? So that ceiling, um, my sister had an inspiration picture from a hotel um, in Italy, which had like a beautiful coved um, uh, ceiling. And of course we couldn't achieve that in this house. And, um, and so I went to uh, JP Weaver, um, which is in Glendale and they have beautiful decorative moldings. And so we did that treatment in the hallway, the bedroom ceiling, in the bathroom. And it just, again, gives it a little, not a little, it gives it a lot of detail that you pay attention to and it's elegant and it's, you know, it's special. It's really, and so that, you know, is part of the Fabergé egg, it's the detail. And I have to tell you, Lisa, that every time I go back to the house, which I do, I'm, I'm there every couple of months, when I walk in, it's like all new. It's like, oh, I love that. And oh, it's, it just feels so good. And it is a house that they entertain in, that they love and live in. So that's also what makes it very special. Right, 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 right. That it's not for show. It's actually for living your life and existing and, and making memories and, right. and all of that. Absolutely. Um, well, Dana, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. It was so good to, to chat with you in, in sort of real life. <laughs> um, and uh, so I, I appreciate it so very much. And, and thank you so much for taking us through this really, really special project. Thank you for having me.